Isaac, the, uh, uh, from whom the Jewish nation would descend, Ishmael, from whom the Arab nations would descend. And they didn't get along at all throughout their lives, but the Bible tells us that they got together when Abraham died mm -hmm. to bury him, to give him a dignified burial in the cave of Machpelah. And, um, and that's the that's the beginning, the 4,000-year-old beginning for the Abraham Accords. It was the agreement between the two sons of Abraham to reconcile that now 4,000 years later inspired the many, many, many generations further of the sons, still the sons of Jacob, the sons of Isaac, and the sons of Ishmael reconciling once again. It can be said that for everything we wish to learn or want to become, there is a road to follow. From the beginning, the road to believing in only one true God, the maker of heaven and earth, has carved its route through the ancient land of Israel. It is a road that Abraham, the father of nations, walked as the first believer in monotheism. It was along this road that God made his covenant with Abraham promising that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. It is a road walked by Jesus, the central figure of Christianity. This road is deeply symbolic in the story of God shared by Jews and Christians. And it is a literal highway that bisects modern Israel, where it is now known simply as Route 60. Route 60 follows the ancient path from Nazareth to Beersheba. It connects many holy sites and biblical events in what could be called the original Bible Belt. It has mile markers, human and divine, to memorialize the acts of celebration, suffering and salvation that are woven into Israel's history. I'm David Friedman, and I invite you to join me and my co-host and fellow traveler, Mike Pompeo, as we explore the ancient mysteries of Route 60, the biblical highway. Praise comes to you from Jerusalem, the city of God, the place that he said his eyes would never depart. Mm -hmm. And today we welcome Mike Pompeo, David Friedman. It's not often we have a former secretary and a former ambassador on set. So I'm gonna wear you guys out, okay? <laughs> Let's start with something everyone needs to understand in our audience. Why does Israel matter? And what benefit do our viewers get from Israel in existence here? Uh, it's really an easy question to answer for an evangelical Christian why this place, this very special place, Jerusalem in particular, but Israel as the eternal homeland of the Jewish people, the undivided capital, is, is something that is central to our understanding of the Bible. It is historical, it is foundational. If you walk these roads and you walk these places, it, there can leave no doubt that this is where Jesus traversed. Uh, for a Christian, this matters an awful lot. Uh, as an American, uh, they're great partners. Uh, they are a great democracy. It's a place where religious freedom can thrive. Uh, just behind us, you have Arabs and Christians and Jews together. Um, and then this is a place that God bestowed something really special. It's a place that the Bible teaches us we'll all come back to. Uh, it's also a place where uh, a, a lot of our young men and women who serve in the United States military have had to come and be in this place and risk their lives. And so it was really important that we get it right, get it right for America, get it right for the Lord, get it right for our security. Uh, I'm really proud of the place that the region finds itself in today. And it is really important for Christians and Americans to understand the history of this very, very special place. When I look at America, you ask, why is it so important to America? Would I worry about America? You know, it's not, it's not about Republicans and Democrats, it's about whether or not America becomes untethered from the values that made it a great country. Wow. And those values, they came right here. How do we know that? Because our forefathers signed the Declaration of Independence that said human rights are not determined by the sovereign, they're endowed by our creator. <laughs> and where did our creator uh, speak? From where? 
Well, Isaiah says, out of <laughs> Zion goes forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So the values that have made America great come right here, right behind us is where those values come from. And if we lose those values, we lose the greatness of our country. And that's mm -hmm. why more than anything else, I mean, of course, there's all kinds of commercial and intelligence and military, and nobody knows that better than <laughs> someone who was both the Secretary of State and the head of the CIA. So no one knows that better than this guy. Everyone that's viewing on TBN cares about is God's providence, that God does control the affairs of his men, plan. yeah. his plans, his purpose, his future. Look, everyone from the macro to the micro, everyone, you know, everyone cares about the fact that God loves us. Yeah. He cares for us. He has a plan for our lives. Okay. It's just some people are involved in a level of politics and, you know, that you guys represent. Okay. So I'm not going to, again, I'm going to wear you out on this <laughs> thing. All right. It was not long ago that I was sitting in front of Mikhail Gorbachev in Moscow and a friend of a friend got us together two days and we did some interviews with him that lasted over two days. We, we, we have this all on camera and I asked Mikhail Gorbachev, you know, I've read many things about you. You were the last secretary of the Soviet Union. Yeah. But, sir, you were named by the priest. Your name was changed to Michael. Your mother was a strong believer in Christ. You know, you grew up on the bureau with a picture of Lenin and Jesus, which is an odd thing to, to grow up with. But, but I said, there are many things in your life that would lead me to believe that you're a believer in God, sir. Do you believe in God? Okay. He, 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 he politicianed me for, for <laughs> half a day. Okay. And didn't answer the question and said, I've done this and I dis. You tell me, do I believe in God? You know, he did, he did that kind of thing. Finally, I asked the same question seven times and I finally got him to agree that God used Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev to make the world a safer place. Do you agree that God was providentially using you and Ronald Reagan? Duh. And finally, <laughs> finally he went, duh, you know, yeah. yes. Yeah. And, and I got up and kissed him on the head and, and it was, <laughs> it was a great moment for me. I, I felt like I won the interview. <laughs> and, and so I don't need to, to drag this out of you guys. You're both on the record in regard to this, but, but give our viewers an insider view somehow think of a story think of a, a moment in time think of something where you for sure you, you knew god had placed you there at that time for the purposes and the plans that he had david why don't you go first well you know i uh i i address this a little bit in the book i wrote in in, in the following way um i don't have uh Mike Pompeo's resume. So I was even a bigger long shot than, <laughs> than, than him to get to this path. So I'm, I'm practicing law. Uh, I'm the son of a rabbi. I'm traveling to Israel uh, often because it meant so much to my parents. Uh, never thought that I would ever uh, be involved in any pro-Israel, real professional Jewish activity. In fact, I once told my father I was thinking of becoming a rabbi. And I'd say there were only two times in my life I remember my father cried. Once was when his father died, and once is when I told him I thought I might want to be a rabbi. <laughs> so, so I I didn't see any of that coming. And then you know um, I have this relationship with Donald Trump. It's a business relationship. I'm his lawyer. I represent him on a few cases. And I'll tell you, most of those cases, uh, I didn't think I was going to win, and I did. And it wasn't because I was so skillful as a lawyer. I just don't. I mean, at the time, I thought it was really great luck to have won those cases. Wow. Um, you know, later on, as he started uh, his path to the presidency, I didn't think he would get the nomination. I didn't think he would win the presidency. Wow. Uh, I had hoped he would nominate me for the ambassadorship because we talked about it before he, before the election. I didn't know if that would happen. I didn't know if the Foreign Relations Committee would give me a fair shake, didn't know if the Senate would vote for me. I didn't know if all the people in the State Department that preceded you 
beginning with you know your predecessor and others would ever give me you know any space mm. to start you know working towards the embassy move i mean there were long shots after long shots after long shots so the way i look at it is you know you take a die right it's got six six different uh, options if you spin it right so you spin it once you have a one out of six chance of getting a particular number uh you want to roll a three ten times in a row yeah you know what the odds are it was 165 million okay so you get to the point where something becomes so improbable that it starts to border on impossible and when the impossible happens then you only have one explanation and, and it's god and i always looked at it that everything that was happening here along the way was a continuum of unlikely times unlikely times unlikely that made me feel that this was entirely um, a glide path that was orchestrated from the beginning by God. And I've always felt that. You know, God specializes in that, by the way. Think of, <laughs> think of Esther and, and, you know, think of David and Goliath. There are many examples in the Bible of God using the least likely to do the most important task. And, and I think that if the Bible was be written today, if it was still being written, I'm not sure who would canonize it. But at some point, <laughs> I'm not sure we could get everybody. <laughs> if, 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 if my team does it, it's not worth anything. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure that's even working. But I think that you're you're making a point that is very valid. That God specializes in this kind of, you know, least likely thing. And so I think that God specializes in these kind of long shot things and. We get to we get to all qualify as the least likely. <laughs> okay, we so all true. we all get to qualify as that, and so that's amazing. Yeah, Matt. Not only does the Lord put people who uh, you might least expect to be in those places, He also quite through His grace puts people who are totally imperfect okay. <laughs> and totally unup to the task before them. Um, I remember when I was uh, became the CA director, it just was so big, right? And then I became the Secretary of State, and these jobs I knew were bigger than me. And so I, as a Christian, I would pray each day that the Lord would help guide me and provide me with the wisdom that I needed. You you asked when when did I know? Uh, I remember I was I'd been the CIA director just for a few days and I came here uh, to meet the director of the Israeli intelligence service, the head of Mossad, um, because we, we I was very confident of President Trump's direction in the Middle East. I knew he was going to build this relationship with Israel. And I knew I didn't know how it would unfold. And I was just a CIA director. Um, but I knew that Iran was going to be a, a threat and we had to get this right. And so I came to try and build out that relationship. And so there I am sitting with a career spy. I was a pretender, right? I'd been a congressman and a machine shop owner uh, in Wichita, Kansas. Um, he'd been 30 something years in, in Mossad. Uh, and I, I looked him in the eye and said, we're going to we're going to do good things together. He's a faithful Jewish uh, Orthodox Jew. Uh, and I said, we're going to go do important good things together. Our, our leaders, Prime Minister Netanyahu, President Trump are going to ask our teams to do that. And I, as soon as he responded, I knew that there that the Lord I had put something in store. I could have never dreamed that I'd be the Secretary of State after that and then ultimately be uh, part of uh, putting together the, the the complexity that was the Abraham Accords. Um, but I, I remember thinking that day, there's something special going on here between the leaders that the Lord has put in place for this moment where we can put aside our, our, uh, our personalities and our differences and work uh, across a shared continuum to deliver something that's really unique and historic. And uh, it wasn't too many years later that we actually achieve the Abraham Accords. And there is no doubt that the Lord put each of us in, in those places uh, through his grace, not through, not through anything that any of us deserved, um, but through both the works that we did and his grace. Hebron, yep. you and I were there yesterday. And uh, of course, it's the burial place of Abraham, among others. And Abraham was buried there uh, by his two sons, by Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac, the uh, uh, from whom the Jewish nation would descend, Ishmael from whom the Arab nations would descend. And they didn't get along at all throughout their lives, but the Bible tells us that they got together when Abraham died mm -hmm. to bury him, to give him a dignified burial in the cave of Machpelah. And, um, and that's, the, that's the beginning, the 4,000 year old beginning <laughs> for the Abraham Accords. It was the agreement between the two sons of Abraham to reconcile that now 4,000 years later inspired the many, many, many generations further of the sons, still the sons of Jacob, the sons of Isaac, and the sons of Ishmael reconciling once again. I remember a very important phone call 
again, it was David Friedman on the line. And, and he said to me, much what you just said, Abraham's sons reconciled for a brief moment to bury their father and their descendants are now coming back together again after 3,000 years. Let's go tell that story. Yep. And I just, <gasps> you know, and, and I think we were on record saying it was an immediate yes. And we were in production almost immediately. I'll tell you a funny story. I say to him on the phone, I go, David, listen, uh, just don't happen to have Donald Trump's your cell phone number or <laughs> Mike Pompeo's or, 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 or vice president, you know, vice president yeah, yeah. Answering. Yeah. I don't have Nikki Haley's phone number. I don't have any of these people's phone numbers. Are you going to be able to make these calls? He goes, yeah. He goes, look, give me a couple, three weeks and we'll get, we'll get some of these things. And no joke. It wasn't, it wasn't two hours later. <laughs> he called me back. He goes, Trump's on the 24th. <laughs> 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 yeah. Pompeo's uh, going to come in on the same day with, with the vice president. Yes, and, that's right. You know, and so basically, literally, he was the one that we got to tell the story of. And look, I'm not a politician. You can tell that by what I'm about to say. <laughs> but basically, the the policy of most administrations for a good 20 or 30 years was insanity. That you had to fix one problem before anything else could go was putting a pair of handcuffs on, on this whole thing. And your administration threw that out. You just said, we're going another direction. That's a brick wall. And we're just heading this way. And guess what? That diminished. Look. Just find the people that, that want to do it. <laughs> right. That agree yes, with you. Exactly. That's all we have to do. Get the believers. Get the people that that want the same thing. And they're everywhere. And you know, what, you know President Trump in, uh, in uh, May of 2017, he goes and he speaks to 50 plus Arab nations in Saudi Arabia. One of the things he says to him is, look, you guys got to get out of your head the idea that Israel is not going to exist. Yeah. Put it out of your mind. Yeah. It's wasted energy. It's wasted effort. It's never going to happen. Okay. <laughs> now, what can we do together? Yeah. And um, no one had ever said that before. Yeah. It was always, you know, Israel's got to be managed, not too strong, not too weak. You know, this Goldilocks approach to Israel. Why? Yeah. It's a tremendous ally, as Mike said, tremendous ally of the United States. Uh, it, it, it provides us, and, you know, you, you know this far better than me, but it, provi it has eyes on threats that affect America, that it will go through heaven and earth to, to share with us so we can be safe. Um, why would that, why would you want to manage that relationship? You want to embrace <laughs> that relationship. And, and that is, that's how we started off. There are so many stories in the Bible where people are hesitant, fearful uh, to tell the truth. Yeah. Things that they know to be true. And uh, I think it's I think it's the case that in each of those, when when they're finally able to do that, when the Lord gives them the capacity to actually speak the truth, the reality, the reality we know of this special place, the fact that this is, in fact, the Jewish homeland. When we spoke the truth, there was there, there was a calmness about it. Right. There was a, a reality. And you could I remember in the run up, uh, the New York Times and Washington Post arrived writing about this without much favor. <laughs> uh, they didn't think this was too whippy. But when we actually did it, when we actually achieved the uh, the outcome, when we held that amazing ceremony here, when the when the embassy was moved, ultimately when the Abraham Accords were announced, there was a peace at hand of no, hey, this actually just this makes sense. We have spoken the truth, and I think I think there's a lot of history and a lot of uh, the good book that teaches us that when you're able to do that, when you speak that truth in a way that is candid and sincere, and uh, I talked about us being imperfect. There, there's no more authentic believer than someone like David, right, who understands these historical truths, uh, when they can see that authenticity, that this isn't, this isn't political, <laughs> this isn't aiming to garner votes or curry favor, this is about uh, achieving a central understanding of humanity and history and our Bible, uh, good things follow from that. You know, one of the things that I'm, I'm hoping for is through the Abraham Accords, more and more of our friends in the Gulf will come to Jerusalem. You see Israelis and Emiratis and Bahrainis and Moroccans, they actually like each other now. I mean, they're traveling back and forth and they're visiting each other. We confronted and I think we defeated hatred. 
which is, I think, the hardest thing to do. I mean, hatred is the toughest emotion to break. We haven't broken it fully. There's nothing I'm more proud of than where there once was hatred, we now find love. I think it's the highest level that we can achieve in our careers, in our professions, in our, in our faith. Hey, I'm Mati Shoshani, and thank you for watching the TBN Israel YouTube channel. We hope this video gave you greater understanding of Israel and her people. If you haven't already, subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you never miss a video. We'd love to hear from you, so be sure to share what you've learned and ask your questions and comments below. And invite your friends to join the conversation.